Teenagers across America are playing with a new and frightening game, Satanism. Their school books are marked up with satanic symbols, upside down crosses, pentagrams, the number 666. Their fashions glamorize the demonic. They are seduced by heavy metal heroes, many of whom feature satanic imagery in their songs and album covers. For some of these young people, the fixation on violence, evil and death leads them to commit abominable crimes, including suicide and human sacrifice. Joseph Beeson, 18, and Edward Bennett, 19, both raised in Mormon homes, drew blood from their own veins and mutilated animals in satanic rituals. But that wasn't enough, so they eventually killed 18-year-old Michelle Moore. Sean Sellers, 17, the youngest death row inmate in Oklahoma, brutally murdered his mother and stepfather because they tried to prevent his satanic rituals. Scott Waterhouse, 17, tortured and killed a 12-year-old girl in a grisly satanic slaughter. Pete Rowland, 17, formed a satanic cult with three other boys. After sacrificing a cat, they turned on Steve Newbury, the fourth member of their group, and beat him to death with baseball bats while chanting, a sacrifice for Satan. Richard Ramirez, the night stalker, was convicted of 13 murders and 30 other felonies. During the summer of 1985, he beat, strangled, raped, sodomized, shot, and slashed his victims in a rampage of sadistic satanic slayings. In the spring of 89, the dead bodies of 13 victims, one of whom was only 16 years old, were found mutilated and buried in a common grave near the American-Mexican border in Matamoros. This satanic drug smuggling cult believed that sacrificing humans in bizarre rituals would give them magical protection. The victims had been dealt blows with a hammer and some suffered horrible mutilations including the removal of brains, hearts and other organs that were then boiled in blood. For those of us who have been involved in cult and occult research over the years, these atrocious reports are unfortunately nothing new. They are only the tip of the iceberg. Because Satanism is by nature clandestine, it's hard to estimate the numbers of people involved. Not all satanic groups are involved in criminal behavior, but with increasing frequency, law enforcement agencies across North America and Western Europe are receiving similar reports of illegal activity. Satanically inspired child pornography and ritual abuse, animal mutilations, human sacrificial murder, cannibalism, rape, sodomy, desecration of graves and Christian churches are just some of the findings. Victims are from all walks of life. Their stories are grotesque and beyond human belief. The purpose of this video is not to over-sensationalize a hideous subject, but rather to inform you of a very real problem that is sweeping across our nation. What used to be hidden or secret is now arrogantly brandished in public by Satanists who recruit openly and display macabre graffiti and gruesome mutilations in public places. In this video, we wish to educate you and your family on how to protect yourselves from the effects of Satanism. Today, a growing number of people don't believe in the existence of a personal god or devil. However, many believe in a force or universal power which can be tapped into at will and manipulated, used for good or evil, they believe, by performing various techniques and rituals. Among subscribers of this occult philosophy are white witches, black witches, and Satanists. Satanism and, and black witches worship Satan. Alongside of that, you have people calling themselves white witches or Wiccans, who claim that they have magic powers, but they only use them to do good. There's a lot of confusion between Satanism and witchcraft. The two terms are usually lumped together as one. Satanism, as it stands, is basically a reversion and perversion of Christian symbolism. 
whereas witchcraft, or wicca as we prefer to call it, is a totally separate, autonomous organisation that, that has its own form of worship which is not related to Christianity in, in any way at all. When I first got into Wicca, it looked really good. It, 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 it seemed to be white and innocent and just going out and like gathering herbs and worshiping nature. But as I got into the higher degrees, I learned that the name of the horned god was Lucifer. And I learned that, the, for instance, the sign of second degree was an inverted pentagram, which is, of course, the symbol of black magic, the five-pointed star turned with the two points up, symbolizing the horns of Satan. And it began to dawn on me that there were things here that weren't quite as they should be. According to my Bible, witchcraft is witchcraft. God does not distinguish between black or white or gray. Uh, witchcraft allows you or teaches you to depend on supernatural powers and spirits to get things that you want on this earth. So I believe that despite all the good that Wiccan think they do, their power source is exactly the same as that of Satanism. Many officials have been reluctant to admit the horrendous ramifications of satanic activity in America and Europe. But despite opposition, some people have come forward and spoken against the upward swing of Satanism as a serious epidemic that must be considered. David Wilshire is one such person. As a British Member of Parliament, he actively alerts his fellow countrymen to the growing dangers of Satanism. Once you open up the mind to the sorts of ideas and imagery and history of witchcraft, where is the dividing line between something which is a bit of a giggle and something which slips very readily uh, in, into full-blown Satanism, if that's the right phrase for it, where there are no bounds to how nastily and foully you treat other people for your own gratification? Englishman Alistair Crowley, a leading inspiration in today's revival of Satanism, was a bisexual heroin addict and demonologist who was violently opposed to Christianity. In his book Magic, he detailed the proper procedure for performing a child sacrifice. Crowley's powerful influence is seen in such groups as the OTO, Ordo Templi Orientis, and Colonel Michael Aquino's Temple of Set, an offshoot from the Church of Satan. In 1966, Anton LaVey founded the first Church of Satan in San Francisco, which at one point claimed 10,000 members. LaVey authored the Satanic Bible and Satanic Rituals, two of Satanism's most important books. Astonishingly, when the Satanic Bible was first published, it outsold the Holy Bible two to one in many parts of America and ten to one on some college campuses. It teaches tenets that are totally opposed to goodness, purity, and selfless behavior. All religions are coming around to Satanism. We're in the uh, very throes of a new Satanic age. The evidence is all around us. All we have to do is look at it. Shemham Barash. Shemham Barash. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. To the Satanist, good is evil and evil is good. The truth is a lie, and a lie is a truth. Sweet is bitter, and bitter is sweet. And everything is twisted around the other way. The Satanists have merely followed the pantheist way of thought to its logical conclusion. If there are no absolutes, if God doesn't exist, he hasn't said, uh, set absolute limits to what we can do. So therefore, anything that the self decides at once, the self can go after. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural uh, feeling. And therefore, Satanists take that to its extreme and say, if I want to be violent, I can be violent. If I want to hurt others to gain my way, then I can hurt others to gain my way. Uh, there are generally four different groups of Satanists. Uh, we would like to classify them as the, the dabbler, then you have your religious Satanist, then you have your non-traditional Satanist, and then your generational Satanist. The dabbler we would classify as the teenager. The teenager would uh, simply learn some things from his friends at school, dabble a little bit of the Ouija board, go down the library or the local bookstore and pick up a book, and kind of do his own thing. 
not real dangerous, uh, but he can be moved to, into further areas which could be criminal or dangerous in nature. The dabblers are the people who are putting the graffiti up on walls, knocking over tombstones, and making a general nuisance of themselves in the public. They are the ones also who will do the uh, animal sacrifices, and they're really novices. They're considered uh, lower-level Satanists by those who are higher up into the Satanic realm. Uh, the religious Satanists are uh, protected by law. Anton LaVey's First Church of Satan in San Francisco would be an example of that. They are religious in their approach, and they try not to violate any man-made laws because it is um, not productive for their own self-interest. Now, the non-traditional Satanist is a gentleman or lady or the group of people who would uh, take certain ideologies, develop a cult, usually polarized around some central theme, oftentimes taken from a biblical aspect, and uh, use that to uh, commit crimes, or they may not commit any crimes, but uh, for what we're talking about for these purposes, the non-traditional Satanist is oftentimes the most dangerous. Now then there are generational Satanists. These are people who would have Satanism in their family and it's passed down from generation to generation, just as the name would intimate. And these Satanists would produce all kinds of horrors uh, secretly. From infancy, they, they have uh, learned all these things. They have been molested, forced to drink blood, eat feces, uh, urinated upon, sodomized. And just from generation to generation, it continues. Many Satanists recall being fascinated with occultism at a young age. Some had been ritually dedicated to Satanist children. One person who remembers being initiated by his grandfather is Glenn. One year at a family reunion, he took all the cousins, all the little kids, and he lined us all up in a row. And he went down the line, just one by one, putting his hand on our heads. And he came back and stopped at me. And he said, this is the chosen one. After that, he took me aside into a barn where it was private, and he laid his hands on my head, and he said, at the moment of my death, I pass over all my power and my ability to you. I was uh, finally given the wonderful privilege of realizing that Satan was the god of witchcraft, and uh, I was... Uh, at that time made it very clear that if I really wanted to progress much further, I would have to sell my soul to the devil. Their main teaching is that um, Satan had a part in creating the world with God. And he was wrongfully um, thrown out of heaven when he asked for equal power along with Jehovah God and that one day he would regain his rightful place. So we um, have to make his army bigger. So the more recruits there are in um, Satanism and um, the occult on the earth, the quicker his army would grow and then he would take over and overthrow Christ and the Christian church. Now, worshiping of Satan is not a crime in the United States of America. It's protected under the First Amendment. Therefore, if you see a group of people dancing around a fire, they're not committing any crime. There's nothing that, that the United States law enforcement can do. It's not against the law to be a, a Satanist or to be a member of a witchcraft group you know, or to be a doorknob worshiper. I don't really care what you form a religion is. I don't investigate the religion. It's the crime I investigate. There are no statistics to prove uh, anywhere in the United States of America or the world that this stuff is widespread. But it's my opinion that it's more widespread than you can shake a stick at. Satanism in the United Kingdom is on the increase. It is, I believe, one of the fastest growing religions, as it is legally known, in this country. In Britain, we are beginning to see that Satanism is widespread. From the contacts we have through social services, voluntary agencies and the police we are beginning to monitor the situation therefore developing a picture which is showing that we have a very serious problem the real Satanists the hardcore Satanists are involved in criminal activity and for that reason they are going to try and look as normal as possible the better to be able to deceive you they're doctors they're lawyers they're teachers they're 
oftentimes people who are in positions of great influence over small children. Priests, ministers, doctors, police officers, judges, uh, businessmen, oilmen, teenagers are all linked together for one purpose, to sacrifice whatever they want to Satan. It would be a whole lot easier if these people wore, you know, a, had horns and a pitchfork and a red suit, but they just don't. They could be your next door neighbor. I know when I was involved in the Church of Satan, they were very proud of the fact that there was not a single military installation in the world that did not have a outpost of avowed Satanists. Uh, Satanists are drawn to the military because of the idea of war and death. You see, they view war as one gigantic human sacrifice. Satanism, we are finding, is becoming international and interconnected. They are interconnected in Britain from one city to another and into Europe and into America. A lot of money is involved, a lot of finance. And this finance is made through pornographic videos, through drugs, and through arms. As far as the attraction, I mean, what, what actually would make somebody become a Satanist? Well, for some people, in my case at least, it was a gradual infiltration. It was a move from things like ESP and flying saucers and then just a very gradual, many-year slide into finally regarding Satan as my God. I got into Satanism simply because of the promise of power and wealth. And by being invited to some parties which I went to, I was told I could have those things, but it was a, a special gift that I couldn't have until I had been initiated. I think it can be put in one four-letter word, lust. And I don't just mean sexual lust. There, there is a, a lust for power that is part of our sinful nature. There is a lust, of course, for sexuality. And there is a, a kind of, uh, C.S. Lewis talks about it as a spiritual lust, as the kind of, of, of spiritual itch to want to somehow reach into the unknown. We're fascinated by it. As a young boy of 13, 14, I practiced magic. When you're that age, there is no limit to your, the scope of your imagination. And so, everything magical that we'd heard of, we tainted. Calling forth the devil, invoking demons. We tried all these things, and with some effects. In 1981, Mark's quest to experience the more powerful side of black magic led him to start his own satanic coven, the Temple of Olympus. As far as I'm concerned, magic is about getting what you want. Magicians are people who get what they want. The main theme of devil worship and follows along the teachings of Aleister Crowley, which is do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. And you break all that down, all that means is to do whatever you want to do. They, they cater to your needs to get you involved. They want the quick, slick answers to life by calling down these forces so they will be able to manipulate uh, whatever they need. If you're not popular, you are told that certain rituals, compassion rituals, will gain you popularity or gain you prestige with the opposite sex. And this is something that is also a lure to the Satanists. It's the basic uh, elemental carnal lusts of the flesh that uh, draw them in. They taught me um, how to kill someone, a spell, how to kill someone, a spell, how to get someone to lust for me. We had a lot of spells that would, uh, you, would, you, you would use to uh, hurt someone. It, it, just knowing that we had that information there in front of us really gave us a sense of power. From our experience, a child has turned to Satanism initially because of an emotional reason. We have many more children coming from single parent families or where the, f the head of the home, the father, is not taking the fatherly role. With teenagers especially, the appeal is to rebellion. The appeal is to do whatever you can do to drive your parents crazy. They want to supernaturally get back at their parents. And we have found a lot of teenagers wanting to do it that way. The other reason, I believe, is because the church has not met the needs of these teenagers. They have not seen the supernatural power of God in the church. They've not really seen the love of Christ amongst the people. 
National news coverage brought the demented crimes of self-styled Satanist and serial murder Richard Ramirez into public attention. His crimes included raping a woman in the same bed as the dead body of her husband, whom he had just killed. She then listened helplessly as Ramirez sodomized her eight-year-old son. Another woman was forced to swear allegiance to Satan as Ramirez beat and raped her, while yet another elderly lady had a pentagram carved on her thigh. Ramirez arrogantly brandished secret satanic symbols to the press. He flashed a two-fingered devil sign to news reporters, prominently greeted the courtroom with, Hail Satan, and conspicuously waved the pentagram drawn on his palm. You don't understand me. You are not expected to. You are not capable of it. I am beyond your experience. I am beyond good and evil. I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells within us all. That's it. Today, Satanism can be seen to be more blatant than ever before. Satanic graffiti is no longer shocking, while recruiting, which was once hidden and obscure, is now visibly public, and sadly, youth are the chief targets. When Satanists want to recruit, we know that it's been going on for many years, this is not new, but their arrogance and their outwardness about the way they recruit is becoming unbelievable. Recruiters will go out there into various high schools and draw kids into the system because they're very street smart, some of these Satanists, and they can draw these kids into it very seductively where their parents may not even know it. Uh, sometimes they'll simply uh, suck them in through the local high schools, uh, sex and drug parties. Um, you know, they may go to the local uh, bus station, find the runaways down there, skid row, or they may come from very affluent families. I've noticed that these kids are bored with society. They're bored with school. They're bored with some of the churches that are out there. I have young people calling me regularly, telling me that they have been involved in some sort of animal mutilation sacrifice. And the reason why they say that they go out to these animal mutilation sacrifices is because they're provided with vodka or um, drugs, cocaine, or free sex. And they don't particularly like, as this one girl said to me, I don't really like to hear the squealing animals in the cemeteries when they do their rituals, but they give me free vodka. Repeatedly you see the drug usage being used. Sometimes the high priest or the high priestess won't use drugs because they may not be able to have that mental spiritual control over the people that are in the actual coven, but they will then give it to their members. And so to cover up what I'd seen and what I'd been taking part in, um, I started taking drugs, which they provided. So that was another reason for staying at the coven. Uh, they were providing me heroin. The old proverb warning against wine, women and song has taken on new spiritual momentum. Sex, drugs and rock and roll is the modern cry of a rebellious youth. Satanist Alistair Crowley has indirectly influenced many leading rock groups including the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin and Ozzy Osbourne who even wrote a song about Crowley. Today's music industry commercializes satanic themes without concern for the souls they seduce. Even those bands who promote hardcore Satanism deny that they are Satanists but admit that Satanism sells and that they are simply giving their fans what they want to hear. Many bands get their ideas from horror films and videos which explicitly depict Satanic rituals, death, murder and cruel tortures. Evidence shows music laced with satanic overtones has played an important role in the lives of many of the teenagers who have been convicted of satanic killings. Night Stalker Richard Ramirez, obsessed with the music of the rock group ACDC, admitted that their lyrics influenced his mayhem killings. Peer pressure is, is especially important to the teenager, even more so. We all want to feel accepted. But teenagers need that stability in their lives of knowing that they are able to carry on relationships. And when the majority of their friends are wearing the heavy metal t-shirts and listening to the black metal music that incorporates satanic lyrics, they feel compelled to belong to the group. I see a lot of them that are getting involved in it. And it started out with the music, you know, not all rock music, most of the things like the black metal or speed metal 
type things where they have the heavy satanic type overtones to the music. Your groups such as Venom, uh, Slayer, uh, Merciful Fate, uh, these are bands that will, will blatantly teach these kids various occultic practices. One of the more popular bands playing in London is a group called the Devoted Men led by Mark, high priest of the Temple of Olympus. Mark says he receives transmissions from demon gods and goddesses who give him the music and lyrics to perform on stage. Very frequently there's an otherworldliness about the words themselves. It's almost as if we're not writing the words, but we're just, our hand is performing the action, but it's not our mind. <laughs> Devoted men take the music that we write for the Temple of Olympus and perform it in London at the night spots and venues before a live young audience basically present our message. The band's main function is to recruit new members into the outer circle of Mark's satanic cult. High Priestesses Sarah and Julianne left the cult due to the inner circle's heavy dependence on black magic and perverted sex rituals. The idea of the devoted men, which was the band that they had, was another way to try and get world domination. They thought that by being a successful rock band that they'd get the money to go to the States and open up an enormous complex religion over there. When you first joined the Temple of Olympus you'd attend an outer circle meeting and from going along to that you wouldn't realise what was really going on in the Temple of Olympus at all because that's only witnessed by the inner order. Um, you'd be offering flowers and wine and reading out poetry and everything would be very sweet and very lovely. In Britain we are seeing from the recruitment programmes that we are watching and from the contact magazines that we have, that what is being advertised and what is actually happening in the coven are two different things. We were told to use whitewash liberally and to cover up any signs of, any shades of black magic at all that were in the inner order. And there are many other orders who put on this front of being fairly innocent, but actually when the people are involved and initiated, they see that they are being trained into prostitution, in pornography, as well as into Satanism itself as a religion. When I was involved in Satanism, we basically recruited from the teenage years, but today it's becoming very apparent that uh, they are trying to get children at a very young age and this is done partially through the use of the media whether through things like um, cartoons which begin with with ideas that there is good magic and there is bad magic and it's okay if you use the good magic uh, demonic characters little demon figurines that kids buy he-man on, on the cartoon he-man you have people um, calling down fire, you have people calling down power into themselves from occult, unseen, hidden sources through uh, talismans and through chanting and you have these people saying magic words and then they are empowered and in, endued in, in with power so that child looks at that and says I want to be powerful. Children are being programmed into occult practices by the cartoons and games and stories that they see on television. It seems harmless and fun and exciting. Games like Dungeons and Dragons incorporate actual occult practices into the body of the game where you are, are actually asked to take on an occult persona that has powers. Believe it or not, uh, you can learn spells right out of Dungeons and Dragons. Kids will learn them from the Ouija board. Uh, I have interviewed kids who have played the Ouija board and the Ouija board literally told them how to draw a five-pointed star and how to do a particular spell. When the Ouija board gave us that spell, uh, one of the things it told us to do was to draw a, a pentagram. And uh, we had to chant a certain chant and uh, we burned uh, two black candles. 
sometimes children themselves who have um, played with a Ouija boards believing it to be a bit of fun. They haven't been able to sleep, they've had nightmares and their lives have been completely changed because of some um, involvement which they thought was innocent, which they thought was harmless. The, the Ouija board wasn't enough, so we started getting into the uh, incense books, uh, potions, all kinds of stuff. I went to the school library, I asked for books on the occult, thinking I'd find one or two. There was a whole huge section on the black arts, on witchcraft, on every kind of aspect of the occult that you should want. As I looked, I came across a prayer to Lucifer. Well, I didn't know who Lucifer was because I didn't have a Christian background. But it said, if you pray this prayer for a month, then you will get everything that you want and more. Satanism gives you a sense of power. It gives you a feeling that you have power over your own life. Of course, it's the ultimate delusion because actually what you have done is you have totally surrendered control of your life to a demented, brilliant psychopath, Satan himself. It's very tempting for them to take hold of these promises and sadly Satan is such a liar you know and he's cheating these young people and I care very much I care very much they're being cheated conned and they will eventually die and a lot of them it is because they have at some point been involved with the occult and they die because they can't face the fact that the promises weren't kept. Satanic rituals are shrouded in secrecy. New recruits are often blindfolded when taken to the ritual location or drugged so that their recollections are blurred and their will to resist is eliminated. I was blindfolded, um, taken to the Satanist temple and when I got in there I was astonished to say the least. There was about 400 people or more. They stood and they were worshipping um, the devil. There were effigies of Satan, half man and half beast around the walls. Um, there was a high altar and on the altar um, there were cups and knives. The chief Satanist sat on a throne-like seat. He was robed and hooded. Around him in a semicircle stood um, some 13 priests and priestesses. Of course, you were told, um, you know, not to say anything to anybody. And um, because it was the keynote of the, the movement was secrecy. And little wonder when you knew what went on in there. In Satanism, sex is not only used to lure new recruits, but in a ritual context, sex is also believed to be an important method of inducing power. In the sex ritual, it can be involving either a child, a teenager, or someone in the group, either voluntarily or involuntary. You have to have sex and be initiated with the chief priest. After the chief priest has had you, um, you know, anybody can. One of the biggest rituals I was in was the marriage ritual, and that was where me and my soulmate had to get married. It was required that the male and the female that were getting married sleep with the rest of the other group. So the female that was getting married to me would sleep with the guys and I'd sleep with the girls. Bacchus is the Roman god of wine. Uh, he's also a uh, god of madness and frenzy. Uh, so we had a bacchanalia, which was basically, a, it was supposed to be an orgy. Uh, we had a guest for that one, uh, a young boy. And the energy that was raised from that was uh, used to send all our enemies mad. Sex is very much a sacred thing for magicians of, of all backgrounds. And it's a very powerful thing. And it's one of the most natural things in the world. In a ritual context, it loses none of that naturalness. Sarah another priestess and myself used to have to do uh, lesbian type dances in front of Mark but a lot of this went on um, we were always openly encouraged to do that sort of thing in front of Mark um, it was as if we were entertaining gods 
in Satanism, sadomasochism is way out in the open. I mean, you know, all sorts of tortures and things are done to raise power. We're seeing now what is known as sadomasochistic forms of Satanism, where they'll go in there and they'll self-mutilate each other or they'll sadistically use one of the other coven members just for their own simple gratification. Drawings by children reveal how they were forced to participate in atrocious satanic rituals involving animal and human sacrifice, sometimes even compelled to eat raw meat and drink blood. Heartbreaking accounts detail how children were deliberately trapped in cages or graves for hours at a time, sometimes even with snakes, how they were defecated and urinated on, sodomized and raped by adults in satanic ceremonies. Sometimes adults would wear robes similar to Christian clergy and perform rituals in Christian churches, not only to mock God, but to terrorize the children against a belief in biblical Christianity. And today, more and more cases are revealing an international link between child pornography and Satanism. One of the things that seems to be real consistent with ritual child abuse in your hardcore type groups is the fact that it's almost an indoctrination method to make that child become part of that group. If they can ritually abuse children, if they can in any way uh, sexually abuse children, uh, anything to destroy a child's innocence or their trust or their, their wonder at the world, they will do it. Satanism exists in this country as it exists elsewhere. It is appallingly evil. It is about murder. It is about child abuse. It's about sexual abuse. It is no joke and must be taken seriously and must be dealt with. The, the most tragic stories that I've ever heard are where a child has told people what's been happening and the adults have said, don't be stupid, that doesn't happen in this country. The problem we're coming across is that the higher officials in these public uh, organizations do not want to acknowledge that this is occurring. Is the court system able to handle this type of philosophy? Do they believe in Satanism? I mean, a lot of people just laugh at it. One of the more powerful rituals in Satanism is the Black Mass a parody of the Catholic Mass in which the text is said backwards and in which many other sacred Christian traditions are mocked. In Satanism you have rituals that are designed first of all to deliberately mock God so in, in our particular type of Satanism we would mock like say the uh, the Catholic Mass we would we would uh, consecrate communion hosts and then we would do things like stamp on them or urinate on them or other things, uh, believing that by doing that we were somehow abusing God. I was the altar, uh, which involved me being naked, spread-eagled, on a low plinth. Um, I had a candle in each hand. One of the other priestesses was a nun, was dressed up as a nun. Uh, she had to wee into a bucket, and that was used to asperge us, uh, cover us in it. Uh, we had toast with little crosses on, little circles, and that was used as um, a sacrament, and it was placed up my, uh, whatever I can say on American TV, and then it was placed on my lips, uh, and it, that was how it was blessed. Um, then it was uh, sprinkled with urine and then everybody, it was thrown on the ground and had to be trampled by everybody. Um, and then a lot of Latin guff was uh, talked. Hail Satan, uh, I, um, I rescind all previous uh, allegiances to any other god, you're the supreme, that sort of stuff. All the power that was raised through this ritual was uh, used for killing off Christians. Satanists believe that sexual perversions combined with the spilling of innocent blood conjures up the strongest powers. Reports show animals including dogs, cats, goats and horses being savagely skinned alive, having their blood drained, organs removed or being split open and nailed to upside down crosses. Interestingly, Humane society officials note that many mass murderers were originally involved in animal mutilations. We have an epidemic 
of young people participating in some strata of Satanism. Now, that doesn't mean that they're all out sacrificing human beings, but they may very well be doing the uh, rituals that involve mutilation of animals. One fire department individual told me all of the woods around our area have these types of rituals going on. If you kill an animal, that that exerts a tremendous amount of energy that the people there can sort of vampirize on. And so animals would be slain. Uh, and this is especially true on the high holidays like Beltane and Samhain, Halloween and May Eve. I had my incredibly sharp knife and there was drumming going on in the background. And uh, I thought, you know, it was going to be amazing and then I just cut its head off like that, suddenly. And that was it. They bought in alive a white cockerel, the symbol of denial and they wrung its neck at the high altar and they slit its throat and they caught the blood in, in one of the, the cups from the high altar. My arm was cut. They, they stirred the blood in the cup with a knife. I had to drink that blood, put my finger in the blood and sign a real parchment, not a silly scrap of paper, but a real proper parchment that I would serve the devil the rest of my life. I would strap the animal into the middle of the pentagram. Then I would take a portion of the blood or the body and drink it or eat it. I believe that by doing this, more power and more ability was being placed into my body. There's something about sacrifice. If you do it once, you want to do it all the time. Once, you, once you've actually passed the barrier of sacrificing an animal, you get this sort of bloodlust where you, have, you really want to do it. And I, I really wanted to do it. It's believed that if you just kill an animal, that's not much good. You've got to kill it slowly because, or, and this would be true of a person too, of course, that the, that the screams and that the agony of the animal would contribute to the high level of power. What results we had. After just the first ritual, we were moved to throw every effort into the successive workings. The power, the response. Devil worshipping in the community can just stigmatize that community beyond repair. Probably one of the biggest problems would have to be political. They want to keep it a, a you know, under wraps as much as possible. The reason uh, some of it's being covered up specifically is for political reasons. It's obvious. For instance, a very wealthy community who's plagued with a uh, animal sacrifice in the community, this will use cats for instance. If the mayor of that particular community allows that to be published, what's going to happen to the property value in there? They're going to say there's all sorts of Satanists, let's not bring that up. Animal sacrifices is commonplace today. And in the order that I was involved in years ago, um, there was even human sacrifice. This lady in a black robe came forward with this little baby. And at first I didn't realize it was a, a, a real baby. And she just laid it on the altar. It was breathing, but it wasn't crying. And then the high priest just took the athami, or the ceremonial dagger, and just cut the baby's throat and caught the blood in a chalice. At that point, I, I was staggering, reeling. I thought I was just going to, to throw up. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. But by then, I was so scared that I just stood there. And then when I was led forward, I thought, this is it, it's your turn, they're going to kill you. Um, and I was lifted up onto the altar. Now, I, I at that time was still in white. It was part of a, um, a sacrifice known as the Sacrifice of the White Virgin. Um, and the same blood that had come from the baby was daubed all over my body. Then the high priest raped me. And I think at that moment, I, I was just, the fact I was still alive went through my mind. 
I then had to sign in blood a parchment stating that I would never ever reveal what had happened in a coven. If I did, I would die. If we look at the number of, of children that are missing, uh, the number of teenagers that are missing, I think we can probably, with some degree of safety, assume that uh, a significant percentage of them are ending up dead because of ritual satanic murder. And this is because there are more and more Satanists. Are human beings being sacrificed? Yes, they are. It's, just, it's not all the time what you think, whether they're dragged and carted away and laid on some altar somewhere and cut open and had body parts removed. That's not always what happens. It may be just as simple as someone um, being mad at someone and going up and blowing their head off with a gun or stabbing them with a knife or even poison them. There's a lot of things that I would look for to uh, make a determination on a ritualistic crime. It could be marks that are found at the scene. It may be things like a pentagram. It may be an upside down cross. It could be, again, the number 666. It could be a loss of blood in the body, uh, certain parts removed in a certain manner. They're victims. Some are targeted for specific reasons. One, because they wouldn't join. Two, because uh, they did join and they want to drop out. Some of their victims are themselves. They voluntarily do. When you join Satanism, you take an oath that will state that you're there till you die. And the biggest gift that you can give Satan is to die uh, voluntarily as a sacrifice. Uh, the human being is a precious instrument in the eyes of the Lord. If somebody can come along, a Satanist, come along and destroy, murder something that God loves, that's just what the devil wants. These various satanic covens that meet need to have this kind of sacrifice for their high festival days. And it's sort of a, I hate to say it like this, but it's like supply and demand. The more satanic covens there are, the more children and babies and teenagers are going to be brought out and sacrificed. And again, it is the destruction of innocence that they seek. That's why children are sought. That's why uh, teenagers are sought. That's why, uh, oddly enough, Christians are sought. In my interviews with uh, former Satanists and their victims, it's really uh, a common thing to uh, perform sacrifices and rituals on religious holidays, specifically Christmas uh, and Easter. And when they do it on those days, simply to, to blaspheme the Christian faith. In many satanic groups, a mother will be asked to sacrifice her own child to Satan, and she may even, in fact, be ritually impregnated to do that. She may even specifically have, have been impregnated and then when the child is born they never register the child as being born and they kill it in a very horrible way and sometimes the mother herself is actually asked to do it. From one of the nicer, quieter, more beautiful parts of England, namely the county of Surrey where people would find it hard to believe that these things go on, there is a confession from a, a woman who said that her baby, uh, when born, was used as a human sacrifice in satanic rituals. She said it herself. She has said it in public. Uh, what, do you, what does one make of that other than a, a heartbreaking confession to something that's been a guilty secret for a long time? Because this high priest could have his pick of any woman in the coven, and I was the youngest one there, it was usually me that was chosen. Uh, and then I got pregnant. And I was terrified. I didn't want the baby, but I didn't want it to end up on an altar. The law was that it was the master's baby, and therefore he could do as he wished with it. So at that point I ran away. Audrey escaped, and unlike many others, her baby's life was not sacrificed to Satan. Ultimately, the purpose of Satanism is to commit atrocities against the Judeo-Christian God his laws, and his most precious creation, mankind. Christians are the Satanist worst enemy. They are out to torment you. They are out to blackmail you. They, they will even kill you. They even try to kill me um, when I came out of um, black witchcraft. If you're in a church where the Spirit of God is really moving and where the Word of God is really being preached, and where prayer is really going up to heaven for the salvation of souls, then they're going to regard you as their mortal enemies, and they're going to be out there trying everything they can to, to destroy, to kill, and to maim, because that is, of course, the nature of Satan, and that is also the nature of his followers. 
They will try and infiltrate your church. They will try and set up whispering campaigns against the pastor and the elders. They may even try to seduce the pastor. For two years I was involved in the Baptist church. I was constantly complaining about the pastor's sermons being too long, being too dry, sowing discord between the people, gossiping about others. As each member uh, is initiated into the coven, they are commissioned to do a job. And one individual's job may be to uh, desecrate a church. They'll des destroy or desecrate churches where they'll spray paint Satan right on the altar just to put fear into that Christian church. Some Satanists who were handpicked, um, the most powerful ones, were sent into churches to disrupt the meeting. And we stopped people from going forward when they um, asked for people to go forward and accept Christ as their savior. I personally, in fact, was trained to learn all of the, 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 the Christian jargon, you know, to say hallelujah and praise the Lord and do all the right things. And yet I, I had no more idea of Jesus being my savior than, than a man on the moon. If you can tear down the prayer foundation of a church, then you've destroyed that church. And that's what every witch or Satanist plans to do when they go into a church is to tear down that prayer foundation and the rest of the church goes quickly after that. You did things just because they were evil, just because you knew they hurt God, not because they gave you pleasure, but because you knew that it was a sin against God. I had a 17-year-old boy call me and tell me that a year prior to his call he was considering joining a satanic group and he said the only thing that stopped him from joining was that he had to violate every one of the Ten Commandments. He said he was willing to do that except they were pushing for him to kill one of his parents and that snapped him to reality. Absolute truth guides you. Relative truth constantly changes. If it's constantly changes, your defense mechanisms can rationalize things. Your, moral, your morals within your life will just go right down the drain, especially when you get into Satanism because of its perverted nature. I just didn't have any morals at all. Um, I believe that um, the more I did um, on this earth to promote Satan and Satan worship and um, black witchcraft, I'd have a, a greater a place later on when Satan himself um, would rule on the earth. The secularization of our society, the media, schools, churches and government institutions has created a vacuum whereby Satanism has been able to move in and capture the hearts and souls of a vulnerable generation. At no time in modern history has occultism in its various forms been so widely practiced as it is today. Here are some things that concerned parents can look out for. You can see warning signs sometimes in a perfectly happy, healthy child who suddenly changes so dramatically in his behavior or a child who goes missing for maybe two hours, um, say Friday night every week, and can't tell you where he's been. Or a child who begins to show signs or, or suspicions of drug abuse. You will see the same withdrawal symptoms as you would with drug abuse, where there is a change in personality, aggression, a rebelliousness towards uh, the parents, difficulty in sleeping, um, temper tantrums and wanting to uh, stay in their room so that they can play with the altar or call upon the gods. Pay attention to what, you know, his notebooks, things like that. What's he really scratching or drawing on his notebooks, you know? What's he doing at home, you know? Is he withdrawn into himself? That he, is he avoiding the rest of the family? Look into the room. Or what kind of heavy metal albums are they listening to? Is it black metal like Venom or Slayer or King Diamond? or is it Ozzy Osbourne, things like this, or Motley Crue. Uh, also look in their room. Do they got ritual paraphernalia in their drawers or under their bed or under their mattress? You also need to be aware of what I call spiritual hygiene, the, the concept that, that if a child is bringing home things, uh, rock music posters, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, little demonic toys, uh, He-Man, Masters of the Universe, uh, any of these kind of things can be used as familiar objects and that means that they, they are used by Satan to say, okay, 
you have given me a legal doorway to come into this house. You might be a Christian, but that doesn't matter. You have an idol in your house. I can come into your house, and I can assault your kids. I had a mother call me and tell me about a 13-year-old daughter. The daughter was losing sleep and was vomiting blood. And she said this all happened after a ritual was performed on the daughter by another junior high school student. Now, I asked the mother, well, what about the child's room? Do you see anything in the room that would give you an ind indication that she's really into this stuff? Well, she does have black candles in the room, and she has a skull, and she has heavy metal posters all over, and most of her clothing that she's been buying is all black. I told the mother, I suggest you go into the room and clean it out. Many parents don't understand that they have the right, and not only the right, but the responsibility to go into their children's room. You are not violating their privacy because their privacy belongs to you. The parent today has to spend time with their children. If they don't, this child may spend time with somebody that's very evil. Keep track of where they're at. And if they should say, well, you know, uh, I'm just going to go over there to this party, say, well, fine, you can go, but I'm going to go with you. The greatest protection a parent can do is to keep an open line of communication with the young people. Uh, that's the, 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 the central theme that comes up over and over with kids. Well, I, don't, I can't talk to my mom. I can't talk to my father. Let them know right from the start. It's okay to talk to you. you know? You're not going to condone them doing things wrong, you know, but you're not going to stop loving them either. It's no good shouting and, and getting mad with the kid. It is time to um, put your family in order. If we don't handle this now properly in our church by teaching our Christian children how they, where their protection lies, where their faith is, who is Satan, and where he is in position to the Christian gospel, then we are going to be rendering uh, the next generation useless in defeating this problem which is just escalating. Uh, I stayed in the coven for five years. Now it wasn't my choice. I was too afraid to leave. Um, plus the fact that however often I said to myself I'm not going, I, I was drawn back. I was thinking I don't want to kill my firstborn. They questioned me about it and you know, of my group, they says, well, you know, when is it going to be born and everything? And I didn't really want to kill it, so I tried, I tried many ways to get out. I went to my high priest and I told him, I says, these are the situations. And he says, I understand how you feel. And he says, I regret it now for Big C. I had to do the same thing. If you're in Satanism and you want to get out, you need to find a Bible-based church that has a pastor that understands the problem. You may have to search in any given community to find that pastor, but by all means, call. Ask some penetrating questions. Number one, ask if they believe in the inerrancy of the Bible and the authority of the Word of God. Ask if they believe in a real devil. And then ask them if they believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins and rose again from the dead for their justification. The minister came to see me and he began to talk about the love of God and I said no man you don't know what I've done. I went along to this meeting because he said I should go and it would be good and there they really talked about the love of God to set you free. He really did love me. Jesus died for me and at that moment in me was born hope something I hadn't had for a long time, and I thought, well, what if they're right? I had sent in a check to the uh, Church of Satan at one point just to pay my yearly dues, and when it came back from the bank, some lady had written on it, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. And of course, I thought that was a big joke. And from that time on, my satanic power wasn't worth beans. I went into that meeting determined to disrupt the meeting any way that I could think. But here was a message um, that Jesus loved me and he could change me, he could take the darkness from me. And I realized something. There was nobody, not nobody, who really loved me. Never once did I hear um, Satan say 
and I heard him speak many times, I love you, because he doesn't love anybody. Many disillusioned Satanists made the choice to terminate their alliance with Satan and give allegiance to Jesus Christ. Their decision, however, while ultimately liberating, was wrought with difficulties. Uh, I mean, I, I had a lot of trouble going to church. I used to go into some churches and just throw up. I would go into other churches and start yelling and shouting, and I didn't know why. I was, I really desperately wanted this new life, and I couldn't understand why I would react. I'd throw over communion trays, and people thought I was crazy, and I just ran out of those meetings. When you're into the cult, you're really pretty happy because Satan leaves you alone, you know, because you're pretty much destroying yourself. But when you, uh, when, when you get out of it, that's when he really tries to bring you down. He'll, he'll uh, use your family against you, use a lot of things against you. Trying to be a Christian wasn't enough. I was still in bondage. Satan controlled my mind quite often. I used to fight not to get to psychic fairs. Um, particular dates, I would fight not to get to a coven somewhere. Once you get saved and out of this kind of stuff, you gotta um, renounce everything that you did in your past. And uh, in, in the name of Jesus, you gotta renounce everything that you did. Otherwise, it, you're still gonna be haunted by a lot of that stuff. When Jesus died, he didn't just die to save you, he died to break every bondage that Satan never put you into. Now that was just like the best news I'd ever heard. It's not God versus Satan. God's already won. It's, a lot of people get that confused. Uh, Jesus could bring you out of the cold. He's the way to go. Um, I, I would say anything you're doing with the cold, get away from it's not Satan is lost, and if you're with him, then you're going to be one of the losers. God is not intimidated by any of his creatures, much less a rebellious creature. God is infinite. Satan is finite. God is all-powerful and all-present. He's present everywhere. Satan isn't. God is greater than Satan, and his power can be tapped into by merely trusting his son. If you trust in Jesus, you then have uh, the authority over the principalities of darkness. So if you've only been a Christian for five minutes, you can resist the devil. And how do you do that? Through prayer. You just say, Lord, please take this presence away from me. And what father is going to turn his back on his child when a bully's present? All of a sudden, I was clean. And I could relate to, to God as my heavenly father. Now, that, that was very precious to me because I'd never had a father. And all of a sudden, it wasn't God up there somewhere. It was God very, very real to me. A person's worldview determines his actions. One of the major teachings of Satanism, as spelt out in LeVay's Satanic Bible, is self-indulgence. Contrast this with the teachings of Christ, who asks mankind to accept him as savior, follow his example, and love and care for others unselfishly. There is no neutrality. We either have to choose to apply biblical concepts to our lives, or by silence and non-commitment, we make a stand against them.